very privileged and uh, humbled to be in front of you folks again. Uh, I think it's like my fifth, fifth, I believe, uh, trip down to Oz, and um, it always gives me a great deal of satisfaction to, to resonate with folks that have uh, this kind of mindset about farming and about the environment, uh, about food, about the big picture. Um, I think the only thing I would add here is the, I think the only thing that I had more provocative relative to getting wired up here was going to the men's room without lights on. That was really interesting, you know. Uh, but my, my talk here is, is I'm, a, I'm a livestock guy in, in Pennsylvania, and I work with a lot of uh, what we call smallholders. Um, a lot of those people are the, uh, what we call the plain community. They're Amish Mennonite folks that farm with draft horses. but. Uh, like Lancaster County, Pennsylvania is the second largest production of milk in the United States, second to the factory farming Tulare County in uh, California. So it's a complete mirror image of how agriculture is in the United States, one side to the other. And so we deal with a lot of folks that have to deal with a lot of hands-on. And I like that because um, that, that gets us into the issue of observation. Um, the things that I'm talking about here, it takes me 40 minutes just to get my name and address in front of you, so um, I'm going to have to look at the hook and make sure that I get off the stage in, in due time because uh, I can tend to detour in tangential, tangential ways. But what I'm going to give you are some of the things that, um, the fundamentals that we bring over and over again. I used to have about 50-some clients with, um, with this community before I got more uh, distant from hands-on in the barn. We do a lot of workshops. I work a lot with Dr. Hugh Caraman who's a holistic veterinarian also in Lancaster County. He and I did a two-day workshop in Acres this year, and he was a consulting vet for Organic Valley, uh, the large organic dairy cooperative in the United States. And so we try to do a tango with these folks so that they can get a veterinarian perspective, a hands-on perspective, a holistic perspective, without <clears throat> getting, giving them indigestion. I talk about the big seven for livestock. It doesn't matter if you have goats, sheep, beef cattle, dairy cattle. Uh, dairy cattle are a whole lot more sensitive to the big seven because we're drawing a lot out of those animals once or twice a day. And so we, we try to get these animals in a, in a situation that if you're going to treat animals uh, for livestock diseases, if you're already treating for livestock diseases, our position is you're already behind the eight ball. Something's missing. Something's been ignored. Very similar to crop diseases and crop insect uh, opportunism. So what we look at is what we call the big seven. I'm not going to go over all of these today in great detail, but I am going to cover some of the big ones that we go over over again, and that, that are maybe more relevant to Australia than they are to, to North America in some ways. So we're going to talk about funny protein and forage energy, acidosis or alkalosis, in other words, acidic or alkaline pHs, water quality, uh, mineral deficiencies or excesses, one creates the other, uh, molds and mycotoxins, pasture biodiversity. I'm going to get into that a little bit more. And uh, something I won't get into, but ha I always have to bring up, are EMFs, ELFs, electromagnetic radiation issues. We're seeing a lot more issues, we think, even in the Amish communities with stray voltage issues. My, my sound go off is still on. Still OK? All right. So water is a real big issue. Uh, the state only requires nitrates and bacteria. And this is a lab that we usually refer people to because they can get the most information for the least amount of money. They can get about 52 uh, parameters tested for a little over 100 and some dollars compared to three elements tested at the state lab for about the same funds. But we don't look just at nitrates, and we don't look at just bacteria. We look at iron, and we look at manganese, and we look at acidity and pH, and we find out that if those elements in the water, whether you have well water, uh, cistern water is usually not an issue, but I don't think most people that have a dairy are de depending on cistern water, you might be dealing with uh, ponds, you might be dealing with um, bores, but I want to know what's in that water from not just a nitrate and bacteria perspective, but I want to know whether or not you have high iron, high manganese, because if you do, uh, you're interfering with other elements, antagonizing other elements like copper and cobalt and zinc. Uh, you're also growing microorganisms in the animal that carry things like foot rot, pink eye, uh, reproductive failure. So without going into a great bit of detail on the water issue, we emphasize that water is only second to air, you know, in terms of herd health or human health. So heavy metals sometimes show up in the water, like arsenic. Uh, we had a dairy client just two weeks ago that had acidosis. He's a 100% grazer, and he had acidosis because the pH of his water was 4.6. Very easy to fix. Just run it through a limestone berm, bring it right up to 7, and the animals perform so much better. So these things are fixable, and, and they have to be fixed. Or otherwise, you end up with things that you don't 
know why you have them. Um, iron is a huge issue in Pennsylvania. We have a lot of iron in our uh, aquifers there, and it's very easy to take out. State doesn't require it, but if you don't take it out, you're going to have all kinds of issues like hoof abscesses and pink eye and reproductive failure, unthrifty calves, and so forth. I always bring this slide into the, uh, into the picture because I don't know how many people know who Carnation Dairy was. They were the top herd in the world from 1910 all the way through the 70s. This was 1950, 52. Uh, this was the top producing cow in the world at that time. In the United States, milk production was 5,000 uh, pounds per lactation. That was the national average in 1952. And we were talking about 200 pounds of butterfat per lactation. They had 135 cows producing over 1,000 pounds of butterfat at that time, and this top cow produced 42,000 pounds of milk and 1,500 pounds of butterfat in 1952. Now, if you look at that Carnation Homestead Daisy Madcap cow, top herd in the, in the operation there, she weighed 2,200 pounds. Now, one might believe, well, that, therefore, I want big, heavy cows. It's not about size per se. It's about volume versus weight versus feed consumption versus milk production. Solids produced in a lactation based on the body weight, and that's what they knew back in 1952. We have herds, if you look at the ration on here, this ration is a high forage ration. Only 20 pounds of grain went into that animal and 15 pounds of corn silage. The rest of it was all forage derived. So we've come a long ways, eh, in producing 30,000 pound cows on twice as much grain and three or four times as much corn silage. And burning the cows out. The average age of dairy cows, and we have nine and a half million dairy cows in the United States now, is 44 months of age before they're called. That's not even two lactations. So it's a burn them and turn them kind of a mentality, right? And those animals stayed in the herd 12, 15 years. So what we've lost is the tenacity, the strength. We have fragile animals that are basically dependent upon starch. And when you're dependent upon starch, that's the negative equalizer, because you never can find the strengths because you're inheriting all the weaknesses. So we knew what they were doing back then. We need to bring this kind of, of tenacity and, and uh, anti-fragility back again. Uh, in New York State, one of the top Jersey herds was developed by this gentleman. If anybody wells in the room, acetylene was invented by this guy under Union Carbide. Moved to the Buffalo, New York area, which is way up at the top near Niagara Falls. Bought a family cow, fell in love with the Jersey herd, or breed, I should say and put together a whole breed of animals in concert with grass-based dairy in concert with Ohio State University. Professor Oscar Erf was the investigative uh, scientist with this farm. Uh, those of you that know who uh, Dr. Uh, Pottinger was on the Pottinger cat studies, he was the medical doctor advisor. Dr. Ira Allison was another medical advisor. They were producing milk as medicine, curing tuberculosis when milk at the time was being blamed for causing tuberculosis. They, they actually stuck to raw milk to sanitariums in New York City and other places in New York. But they had, again, a dozen volumes and 300 lab rats. They would do experiments harvesting the milk, providing it to the rats based on controls and treated, finding out whether or not uh, tooth and bone structure improved, whether they mineralized the animals, whether the animals were on this kind of forage ration versus that kind of forage ration. It's a fantastic story. And it was done, again, from about 1922 until the early 60s. And then that herd was eventually dispersed. Because uh, everybody figured it out. Cheap fossil fuels equals cheap grain equals milk production without effort. Right? And look what we've lost. This was some of their medals of merit, gold medal winners, silver medal winners. So these were top herds in the world at that time on forage-based rations. These were profitable dairies. They weren't necessarily, well, at that time, they were, they were not only the most profitable dairies, they were also the most productive dairies, right? Today, what we're looking at is profitability, not necessarily production. If the production is in and of itself not profitable, it's useless. And that's what we've been finding out. That's why we've found, when Bill Clinton was president, we had 132,000 dairy farmers in the United States. And today, we have about 48,000 left. So if production is based on you know, the theory that profit only equals production, something's wrong with that, that equation. So we've lost all these, all these great stewards of husbandry. A lot of these people are very gifted. They know cattle, they're stockmen, but they were told the only way you can be in business is to produce more and more and more. It's all about production agriculture without any profitability and bottom line. Newman Turner was another top producer in the UK around the same time. 
And this was a guy that was vilified for not spending a lot of money on fertilizer. He said, what I need on my pastures isn't more superphosphate like the extension agents were telling him. I need more biodiversity. And a quote that he had here is, the time has come for us to measure the ability of a cow, not by the quantity of milk or butter fat she gives, regardless of all other factors, but by a unit of assessment which takes account of total milk solids production in relation to body weight and food consumed. And we've lost these animals. You have a few herds over here. We have a few herds over there. New Zealand has a few herds over there. But for the most part, every time I've gone to New Zealand, I see more corn silage planted over there. And one of the reasons why is because they nuke all those beautiful pastures with urea and superphosphate, driving the energy rate out of the forages, driving the tannins out of the grasses, driving the energy out of the grasses. And the animals, basically, you have to, you have to wear a raincoat when you're standing behind your cows in the pasture. you know. So when you're talking about protein, I always give this lecture about funny protein. What is protein? What is funny protein? Well, what is protein? There's only 22 amino acids that make up protein. And if you're dealing with crops, if you're dealing with tomatoes, if you're dealing with wheat, you're talking about grow growing quality protein in the plant first so that it has resistance to diseases and you can produce energy. If you have quality protein in your forages, I can guarantee you that your energy levels are going to be as high as they genetically are capable of being. If you have what we call a lot of funny protein, what is that? Well, it's a measure of nitrogen. And why is that? Because if you take a forage test, a forage test measures what we call crude protein, right? What is crude protein? So what is protein? Protein is those 22 amino acids combined in various combinations which make up upwards of 50,000 different kind of proteins from mere 22 amino acids. 22 bricks making 50,000 brick walls, different kinds. The combinations. So what they're measuring is it, whether it's got lysine or tryptophan or methionine, what they're measuring is nitrogen. And the reason why is because all protein contains nitrogen. On the average, it contains about 16% nitrogen. On the average, you know what they say about an average? One foot in boiling water, another foot on dry ice, you're comfortable, right? That's an average. So you don't know what the amino acid profiles are. You don't know. So they just come up with this extrapolation because if you divide 16% into 100%, you come up with a factor of what? 6.25. So what do they do when they take a forage test? They take the nitrogen out of the forage and they merely arbitrarily multiply it by 6.25, and they say your crude protein is 23%. But what we really want to know is, what does it look like relative to that? All 22 are critically important, but you can't make the ones on the right unless you first eat the ones on the left, whether you're a monogastric human or whether you're a ruminant. You must eat the essential amino acids to make the total 22, and then those total 22 amino acids can go on and make the 50,000 proteins that run the entire system whether it's pumping the heart, making milk, putting on weight, getting bread back, all of those proteins are required to start here. So how do you make quality protein versus funny protein? It's fertility issues, it's mineral issues, it's cofactor issues. What do we mean by cofactors? Vitamins in the system, trace minerals in the system. So this is Penn State University's analysis of feed based on, if you look at the top here, these are the essential amino acids here. They're abbreviated, arginine, histine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, and so on. Those are the essentials. Then down here, they have all the feedstuffs that we feed our livestock. Brewers, grains, corn silage, hay. But up here, this is the amino acid profiles of milk from that cow or cows. And here is the amino acid profile of the rumen bacteria. This could be beef cattle, it could be your goats, it could be sheep. The rumen bacteria. And what we're finding out is the rumen, of course, is a sophisticated ecosystem, just like the root ball we call the rhizosphere. That's a sophisticated ecosystem. And who's driving the bus? It's this family of microbes, prey and predator relationships. The same prey and predator relationships that live in the root ball, where you have bacteria that are eaten by protozoa and that are preyed on by fungi, all those interrelationships generate what? More and more protein quality protein, and what we're seeing here is this bacteria, excellent quality amino acid profiles, excellent. So what they're saying is, if you can grow huge amounts of rumen bacteria, you can grow 
all the protein that those animals need, all of it. But it starts in the soil. In a grass-fed environment, grain is an equalizer of weakness in the herd. How do we know that? Why is that statement made that way? Because you're hiding those expressions of the genes. Everybody probably knows that the genotype is based on the history, the ancestry of the family. And then there's what we call the phenotype, which is what? The phenotype is the epigenome. And what is that? The epigenome is the expression of the genes. In other words, environment. Environment dictates the expression of your genetic code, which means you could have an animal with the same DNA history living in Queensland versus Victoria versus Western Australia. Same exact DNA makeup, but you end up over a lineage of time, different subtypes called the phenotypes, which are predicated on the environment that those animals live in. And that's true for humans. That's one of the reasons why we are starting to recognize that diseases in humans are much more profoundly associated with the phenotypical genetic expression of the environment's influence on the, gen, gene, uh, the gene pool. It's not the hardwired genetics. Those are a good start. 90 to 95% of what's going on positively or negatively is, is based on the environment, whether you're a human or whether you're a cow. So that means that the environment of these animals is critical. And that means nutrition, more nutrition, and yet more nutrition drives a lot of how those genes express themselves in a healthy way, because it's inheritable. The thing about epigenetics means it's inheritable. You inherit, your animals inherit the ancestry. And that's the, that's the part that we focus on, the DNA, right? But the expression of the genes, the epigenome, is also inheritable. The good news is, is that if you're living well, if your animals are living well, they pass on really good traits. On the other hand, if they're abused, or you abuse yourself, you pass on and your, your posterity inherits lifestyle. So the critical significance of this is that since 1952, when Carnation had that cow up there on that screen, how many generations of cows have we seen come and go? About 30. So the cow generation is about two years. A human generation is 20 to 25 years. So we have screwed up our animals for about 30 generations with environmental influences that now are inheritable. Now we end up with, what, frail animals that can't do well without grain. Because people say, well, I can't graze well because my animals lose weight. I can't get them bred back and blah, blah, blah. You're right, because you basically bred out what you should have left in. So Albrecht was a guy that was looking at soils, but Albrecht, when he looked at soils, he said, let's look at soils from the perspective of following it all the way through the system. Not just whether you can get a better yield of maize or a better yield of soybeans, but whether or not you're getting the quality that you're really after, because if you're after producing livestock and healthy human societies, you need nutrient density. They didn't really call it nutrient density back then, but that's what they were talking about. So they followed the experiments from the soil, through the forages, through the animals, and found out whether or not nutrient density was really relevant. That, who cares whether or not you have more tryptophan or more nitrogen in the forage? Does it matter? And this is what Albrecht was doing you know, in the early part of the 20th century. So he said, well, where are the healthiest soils? Where are the, most, where are the best soils in the world? And of course, this was the high plains and the great plains that produced maybe the second largest biomass after the dinosaurs. 70 million head of these cattle called bison lived out there. The current stock size of the U.S. cattle herd on the range right now is 46 million head. <laughs> 70 million head without GMOs, without tillage, without herbicide, without fertilizer, without a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, the size of the state of Massachusetts, which is 10,500 square miles of dead zone the estuaries from all the runoff, the pollution, by basically turning that system into a feedlot system. All right? the, the point is, is that he ended up going there, and how did he find out where the healthy soils are, and correlated it with this large biomass of ruminants that moved nutrition up and down through the phasing of grass growing, being consumed, dung and urine, rest, the holistic management system that we now you know, are relearning. He went to the World War I draft records found out where the highest rejection rates and the highest acceptance rates were. World War I. So the United States went to World War I in about 1917, 18. And so he said, okay, the highest rejection rates were in 
the Ozarks, which was northern Arkansas, southern Missouri, and Appalachia, Kentucky, eastern Tennessee. Rocky, thin soils. Because back in those days, people didn't buy, you know, foods from centralized supermarkets. They ate fairly regionally because we didn't have uh, centralized food systems back then. People weren't buying a lot of their produce from California, United States, back in 1917. And where were the highest acceptance rates were in the appetite plain soils. That's what we call appetite soils. These are calcium phosphate soils. Calcium phosphate soils. New Zealand, Australia, and the United States did a lot of work finding out where the healthiest soils were because you have old soils that are deficient in some of these minerals. New Zealand has young soils that are deficient, and we have pockets of these soils. And that's what Albrecht said. Where are the healthiest soils? Where's the biggest biomass? And more importantly, through the draft records, how did you find out whether or not you were eligible for the draft? You didn't get blood tests and CAT scans. You looked at someone's teeth, and you looked at their feet, and if they had rotten teeth and flat feet, they weren't going to war. That's how you bought a mule or a horse back in those days. Still do. The Amish still buy them that way, with a little bit of uh, underhanded stuff going on <laughs> once in a while. But the point is, rotten teeth, flat feet, you were, you, you know, you were staying home. And they found out that the, the people that had the highest acceptance rates were in places like Iowa and Illinois and Nebraska, appetite soils where the buffalo roamed. All right, so we just did, did the opposite with our kids, our young men at that time, that we did with the calling practices with livestock. You know, we sent the brightest, the strongest, the healthiest people to go off to be cannon fodder, right? And we kept the toothless, flat-feeted wonders at home to breed, right? <laughs> Only in those areas, though, not all over the place. So minerals are a big, big part of this whole thing. Matt Albrecht was a minerals guy, and, I, you know, and I, I cut my teeth on the Albrecht model. It's not everything, but it's a foundational thing. So mineral excesses make mineral deficiencies, and mineral deficiencies make mineral deficiencies. That's why I look at the water. And what we see here is 25 elements in bold are considered necessary for cattle and sheep. Total of 78 elements that they've so far recognized, maybe we need all of them, but 78 elements are recognized for cell function, whether you're a bovine cell, a sheep cell, or a human cell. And these are the elements that are missing in a lot of cases. These are the limiting factors. So you, know, you hear these stories, what are your yield limiting factors? What are your health limiting factors? Sometimes it comes down to sometimes a single element. So what this is, is mineral levels, this is out of England, mineral levels and deficiencies in temporary pastures. So you can see that we've got all the macros and micros that we oftentimes test for. So if we have these kinds of deficiencies, this percentage of our pastures that are deficient in these critical elements, and we need all 78 or 92, depending on whose theory you want to subscribe to, these are limiting factors. So you've got to make up the difference somehow. So you either make it up through your soil amendments, you make it up through foliar sprays, you put it out through salt licks, whatever you've got to put out there, but you've got to have them. You can't get something for nothing. The other thing is, is in mineral antagonism theory, you can see that we've got families. So this is the halogen family, all right? So what's in the halogen family? Fluoride, chloride, bromine, iodine. Iodine's the big one. This is a human health talk, but I won't go into it. But iodine is a very, very limiting trace element, and it's also knocked out by fluoride and chlorine. And that's oftentimes found in potable water systems, right? Over here, you can see potassium and sodium. It's one of the reasons why utter edema, animals that blow up with a lot of bagged caked udders. They don't necessarily have a sodium excess, they have a potassium deficiency. Or they might have a sodium excess. Because those two elements are, you know, partners. Chromium and molybdenum, zinc and cadmium. Here's one that's interesting to me, zinc, cadmium, and mercury. Well, I don't want mercury and I don't want cadmium. I would like zinc. Question has, if you have a zinc deficiency, your, your susceptibility to uptakes of cadmium, because they're in the same family, goes up. Your susceptibility to uptake of mercury, because they're in the same family, goes up. So not only are you subjecting yourself to toxic elements by being exposed to them, you exacerbate the problem by having deficiencies of the healthy elements which antagonize them. That make sense? So in the soils, this is why you see these ranges. And, and this is one of the reasons why, if you look on things like the Albrecht model or most of the soil tests that anybody's using anymore, you'll see that this range of availability is right here in this pH of a mid-sixes. That's where you get the maximum availability of the micros and the macros, particularly on crop and horticultural fields. If you have a permanent polyculture on there, however, which if you're grazing, that's what you want, that's what you have, this gets ameliorated because you've got more biology. And biology makes minerals more available in any pH range. 
in any pH range. So if I have a perennial system out there, I'm producing acids out of the root system all the time. This shows you a mineral wheel here. And what do I see? I see <clears throat> all of these elements. There's antagonisms. And you can see the number of antagonisms just with iron, 13, copper, 11, manganese, 10, cadmium, 6, and so on and so on. Mulder's wheel, they call this. And what we're saying here is that excesses create deficiencies, deficiencies create excesses. If you have a deficiency of an element, another element that you don't really want there goes up in its availability and vice versa. These are minerals that are synergistic, so they work together as partners. So if you want an availability of minerals to be more active, they need partners. So calcium needs phosphorus, it needs magnesium, it needs strontium, it needs boron, it needs zinc. If you want to build strong teeth and bones, good frame, you need the whole family that work in these, these concerted ratios that make everything come out so much stronger. And this is not difficult to do, but most people, believe it or not, this day and age, do not test their soils thoroughly and they do not test their forages thoroughly. They don't do any animal testing, like hair analysis. Humans should be doing more of that, but there's a whole lot here that's just guessed upon, assumed upon, because it's all about production agriculture. It's about energy and protein, energy and protein, and not even necessarily quality energy or quality protein. And then the vitamins play a role in here. Vitamins play a huge role because they act as catalysts. What are catalysts? Catalysts are things that speed up biochemical reactions without actually being used up. Enzymes are the biggest catalyst that we can have. And en enzymes run everything. You can't see, your heart doesn't beat, your digestion doesn't occur, your muscles don't contract, you can't breathe. None of these metabolic processes, cow, human, pig, whatever you might be, work without enzyme systems. And every enzyme system, without exception, depends on some kind of mineral family. If you have a deficiency of those minerals, you have a deficiency of those enzymes, which means your immune system can take a hit, your hormonal system can take a hit, you're trying to get animals bred back, they depend on what? A nice synchronicity of hormones at the right time. If those hormones are not operating correctly, here we are talking about humans, you know, at my age, men should be thinking about not just testosterone, but estrogen. Women that are my age should be thinking about not just estrogen, but testosterone and progesterone. You know, you're only as young as your hormones, but hormones are dependent upon the dance of all of these cofactors. So calcium is the king of nutrients, not because it's more important than anything else, but because we use it more by weight and volume. Animals use it more by weight and volume. Again, cow or person. And a lot of your soils here are calcium deficient, and a lot of our soils have calcium excesses, excesses, and that means we have, ironically enough, a deficiency in the plant. Why would that be? We have a deficiency in the plant because in order to get the calcium out of the soil up into the plant, we need to have the other cofactors there, like boron. You have a boron deficiency and a real high calcium soil, you usually see a deficiency of calcium in the tissue. So what good is all that calcium in the soil? What good is it putting lime on, on, on the soil? I was, you know, I was talking to some people in Western Australia a handful of years ago, in the wheat belt, they spray like crazy for various pests over there, insects over there. And they were advised by their conventional advisors not to apply boron because it's toxic. All trace elements are toxic. Every single one of them. Every single one of them. All food is toxic, as well as being nutritious. It's a matter of having the right combinations, right? But every trace element, that's why they call it trace is toxic when it gets above trace. Boron is a toxic element when it gets above trace and if it's not associated with adequate amounts of calcium. Adequate amounts of calcium applied on those wheat fields over there by uh, north of Perth, boron toxicity completely disappears in a, in a New York minute. So phosphorus is really important. I don't care if you're growing crops, if you're growing avocados, or if you're growing cattle, Phosphorus is part of the appetite mineral stuff that I talked about that Albert, Albrecht pointed out. Calcium phosphate make appetite soils. They're the richest soils, all right? Why is phosphorus so critical is because phosphorus is the core element of the energy currency, the energy currency of all life, plants and animals. That energy currency is called what? ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Whether you're a tomato plant, 
or a Holstein cow or President Obama or whoever else you want to fill in there. You need ATP in order to have a healthy combustion of energy. And phosphorus then needs to be 10 minutes. Holy smokes, I think you're cheating. Magnesium is part of that. It's carry for phosphorus in plants. It's a synergist for 300 enzymes, magnesium. 300. Potassium. At least eight enzyme systems are associated with it. In Pennsylvania, we have potassium excesses. May, around here, you might have potassium deficiencies. If you have potassium excesses, you have major problems with getting high quality protein in the forages and enough energy in the forages. We call sulfur the medical mineral. Look at all these compounds that sulfur makes. Heparin, biotin, lipoic acid, glutathione. These are immune factors, detoxifying factors. I call sulfur the detox element in soils and in animals and people. If you're going to put trace minerals down, you've got to have enough of the major elements there. Like I said, don't throw boron on a calcium deficient soil. Get your lime on it first. 1949 research, before they came out with all these fungicides, showed that trace elements were directly or indirectly associated with all these plant diseases. And if you have plant diseases, that means you have lots of funny protein. You can't make quality protein with a lot of deficiencies of trace elements. These are some of the books on minerals for livestock. There's more. A lot of this research is old. Some of it's 60s, 70s, 80s, and even 90s. It's ongoing because we're finding out that the trace minerals and the macro elements drive plant medicine. If you want to have resistance to diseases and insects and plants, 1936, University of Vermont said, if you have a lot of leaf hopper, is that the word they use over here for leaf hopper, or you call it something else? Really loves hot weather when plants are stressed. Really devastates lucerne. 1936, University of Vermont said, if you have a lot of leaf hopper pressure, you have a boron deficiency, not a Saigon deficiency insecticide deficiency. It was boron. Get the boron levels up, you get more pectins in the lucerne. Pectins protect the plant from what? Chewing. And diseases. Pectins. So this is some of the research Albrecht did in isolation, mixing different minerals, isolating them, harvesting, feeding them into rabbits, seeing what the weight gain was. And what did they find out? Yes. Quality does translate into production. Zinc, 200 enzyme systems. Works with vitamin A to create what? Immunity. This is 1940s research, 50s research, showing that zinc creates more vitamin C and beta carotene. Beta carotene is a precursor to vitamin A. However, there's 600 different carotenes now they've identified. In the tomato, the red one is called lycopene. In collard greens and spinach, it's called lutein, the yellow one. And then there's copper to make elasticity with the nervous system, the wiring of the body. It's a powerful antioxidant. It works with vitamin C to, create it, to make it last longer for the immune system. It, carries, it works with uh, creating hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the uh, oxygen-carrying protein in the blood that consists of copper, cobalt, and iron. Manganese. You see a lot of bull calves instead of heifer calves. You've got a manganese deficiency, maybe. Good chance you do, or it could be genetics. But manganese has been studied for a long, long time, going all the way back to the 50s on reproduction in, in cattle. This is, this is 1953 research. Back in uh, University of Wisconsin, they found out that by looking at the manganese levels in fodder, that they could actually triple the weight of the ovaries of the animal merely by getting the fodder levels up with high enough manganese. And that's reproductive performance. Vitamin E goes up when manganese is sprayed on foliage. This is 1950s research. That's how far we've been looking at this stuff. Vitamin E is another, what, antioxidant? It's a vitamin partner. Iron, I never worry about. I don't think you should either. If you have iron deficiencies in the foliage, you have other element deficiencies probably, or you have cold soils or flooded soils. Iron is the second most abundant element in the Earth's crust after silica. So once in a while, we'll foliar spray iron because other things in the soil aren't right, and we just need to get a jump on our chlorophyll. If you want to make photosynthesis efficient, what do we need? Chlorophyll. What makes chlorophyll? The green pigment in the plant. Magnesium, iron, sulfur, zinc. These are elements that make photosynthesis possible. Molybdenum. This is a trace mineral. 
that is needed for what? Nitrogen fixation with legumes like lucerne or clovers. And in animals, it's a nitrogen detoxifier. Helps you detox nitrates. And there's boron I talked about. All the hormones depend on boron. Testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. You have a deficiency of boron, human or cow, you're going to have hormone imbalances. This is just animals. I'm not even talking about the plants. Iodine. That's why kelp is so popular in the United States. I think it's because the iodine levels are so extraordinary, along with the rest of the spectrum of the ocean in there. But iodine works with this gland called the thyroid gland and vitamin A so that the hormones, like the adrenal glands and the ovaries and the testes, can be harmonized and synchronized. Cobalt, vitamin B12. You don't have a ruminant unless you have vitamin B12, and you can't make vitamin B12 unless you have cobalt. By the way, most of that research that I dug up came out of Australia in the early part of the uh, 21st century. That's Australian stuff, because you have big cobalt deficiencies here. Selenium, considered to be a deadly toxic element until 1959. Now we know that it works in tandem with good quality protein. Again, what are we talking about? Amino acids. So what are we talking about? Methionine, sulfur-bearing amino acid, glycine, and glutamine. You take those three amino acids, hook it up with selenium, you make an enzyme. What's the enzyme called? Glutathione peroxidase. Forget about that word. You're never going to remember it anyway. But the importance of it is it drives white cell activity, strong white cell activity, glutathione peroxidase, selenium, and quality protein. Chromium, energy metabolism. They, a lot of diabetics use this almost as a substitute for insulin, along with vanadium. I don't even have that up here, I don't think. But chromium is all about converting the energy from whatever source into whatever your objective is, whether it's milk production or growth on the frame. You need chromium. Nobody looks at this stuff. They just assume that it's all about the basics. Here's vanadium. Vanadium. Now, we don't put vanadium in anything nor do we put nickel in anything, because you can find it in kelp, you can find it in naturally occurring minerals, like these salt licks or these mineral licks that we use over there. We have things called native lick, and we have dynamin, things like this that are naturally occurring deposits. Silica is another one. This is the mineral premix for Andalay Farms back in 1940. This is what they were curing, guess what? Bang's disease, also called brucellosis, and Dr. Ira Allison called it undulant fever in humans, 322 patients cured with nutrition with no relapses in three and a half years. Never done before. There's their premix in 1940. Look how complex it is. They were already discovering minerals in the 1920s and went right to it. Watch the animals eat this stuff. Write it down because it changes. It's a moving target. Write what wild plants they eat, what hedgerow plants they eat, what fodder trees they eat because I'm telling you they're teaching you what's going on nutritionally in their systems because it's a moving target. As the weather changes, their preference for a mineral or a plant changes, and it has a lot to do with the outcome of the animal's phenotype. And so they've been studying it. What are they, what are they looking for? What are they hungry for? This, these are ungulates, wild animals, that they've been studying in North America. And they found out where these animals were, or, the, or these licks, these natural licks were occurring, were in predominantly places that had cities or towns, I should say, with the word lick in them, because the colonists that came over from Europe wanted to eat, so they went where the game was, and they found out where the game was is where the mineral licks were. So they built communities around these mineral licks because it was easy to, to hunt these animals there. And, and wild animals do this all the time. You can see the macaw on the left over there. He's got a big handful of mud. That's a clay of a specific type on a tributary of the Amazon that those birds specifically go after at certain times of the year when the fruit comes into uh, ripening, and the seeds in that fruit happen to be toxic. Anybody ever see their animals eat dirt? Is it, yeah, everybody's seen animals eat dirt. And there's a reason why animals eat dirt. They're either mineral deficient, or they got a toxin, like a mold poison, or they have acidosis from too much grain, or they have funny protein ammonia building up. So basically, Weston Price was a guy that put together mineral nutrition, a dentist from Cleveland that traveled all around the world for 10 years of the isolated cultures all around the world, including Australia, Africa, Central and South America, Polynesia, and he found 14 cultures that ended up being the healthiest people on the face of the earth. No cancer, virtually no tooth decay, no arthritis, no birth defects or morbidity with children. 
And what he found out was even though the diets from blubber from the Eskimos is radically different than the Maasai who were drinking blood and milk, what he found was consistency. Five times more minerals, 10 times more fat-soluble vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K, which work with the minerals. That gave them these picture-perfect health profiles. The same is true with your livestock. And you have to get the minerals as much as you possibly can from nature because they're too doggone expensive to buy them all. If you're going to constantly apply minerals to domesticated crops, you're going to end up spending money. Wild plants harvest this stuff, concentrate it, mobilize it, and this is the kind of work that Fred Provenza from the University of uh, Utah, Utah State, has, has come up with. Animals do selectively pick these elements, and the British have found this out because the Romans put the hedgerows in 2,000 years ago. Right? Because there's not a lot of forests left in the UK. This is where all the biodiversity is left in the UK, is in the hedgerows. And these are fodder plants. We have silvopasturing now starting in the east. In New York State, we have 20 million acres of privately owned forest land. Pennsylvania has 15 million acres, privately owned forest land, and there's this taboo, no animals in the forest, no trees in the paddock. Bad idea. Managing the integration of these two ecosystems gives you the best of the best. Herbivores consume basically three to seven primary plants, but they'll nibble on up to 100 if you give them the choice. And they know how to self-medicate, contrary to what a veterinarian might tell you. A conventional veterinarian says they're too stupid. I can give you stories about that to show who's really stupid, because it's not the animals. And this is some of the research that I did, and I'm going to close up with these two slides. You can go on my website. You don't have to spend any time. I did 22 plants about 12 years ago. Because there's a lot of information on weeds, which nice people call herbs, right? But the weeds are looked upon by herbalists as medicinal. So burdock is good for cancer, or it's good for burns. There's, a, there's an Amish guy named John Keim, who actually goes to burn centers by invitation now where they can't cure third degree burns with burdock, poultices, and salves without any scar tissue. All right? So there's a lot of information about medicinal values of these wild plants, these herbs, these weeds, but there's no nutritional information. So I did only 24 plants because it cost me 35 bucks a pop to get them tested. And what I found out was, holy smokes, this, these are on impoverished soils. I deliberately went to railroad banks, stream bank sites, and things like this. And what we found out was the mineral accumulation of these plants, like boron, which you have to apply constantly to lucerne, is unbelievable. And the digestibilities, and the energy levels, and the quality protein, very slow bypass protein, not this hot stuff. So this is my last slide, and I'm on time, probably not. Uh, so what I'm trying to do, I gave you a lot of information in like a really short period of time, and I'm, like I said, I'm a lousy editor. This is a two and a half day workshop that I just fired off at you, and if you, if you got even 10% of it, congratulations, all right? Because uh, I'm from the East Coast, and I can only talk so fast before you people can't understand me anymore. Uh, but what we're trying to say is, you know, we have a lot of answers. Some of this stuff's already been done. Uh, some of it's in, in development. We have a lot more tools in the box to analyze what's going on in the paddock, what's going on in the rumen, what's going on with the biodiversity interrelationships with livestock, what's going on with nutrition instead of veterinary and conventional medicine. So there's a lot of hope. And now we need to get our animal genetics back to what we once had and boot it up so these animals are incredibly efficient on low inputs, bottom line profitability. Thank you. That's it.